This episode is brought to you by Hoo-Ha. Welcome back to another episode of Girl Boss Radio. I'm your host, Avery. I'm also the founder and CEO of Bloom, an HR and DEI consulting firm, and I'm a big believer that work should work for all of us. If you believe you need to have it all figured out from day one, you'll want to hear from this week's guest, Alexa Suter, the founder of Hoo-Ha, a brand of breathable, non-toxic, and eco-friendly underwear. Alexa has always felt like she was unhirable, and she explains how that shaped her entrepreneurial journey. She's actually never had a full-time job and knew early on that a typical nine-to-five role was not going to work for her. Okay, so I want to give you a heads up. This conversation is unlike any other that we've had on the podcast before. It's raw, it's vulnerable, and it's quite emotional. If your heart is feeling up for it, I'm sure Alexa's story will help you feel less alone. If not, save this for the future, and we'll see you again next week. In today's episode, Alexa shares her journey dealing with grief and how it affected her career, the personal work she did to get through her dark night of the soul, and how she got to where she is today at the helm of a multi-million dollar company. Let's get into it. Alexa, welcome to Girl Boss Radio. I am so excited to have this conversation with you today. So before we actually started chatting, you had mentioned to me that you were feeling very unhirable before starting off your entrepreneurial journey. Can you share a little bit about what made you feel that way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, growing up, it really goes back into my childhood and you know, just having all of these mood swings into my early 20s that really impacted me and my ability to show up consistently. I remember a particular moment, I think I was like 20 and I'm going to university. I was majoring in English because I love to write. And that was something that actually was a coping mechanism for me, you know, emotionally throughout my journey, I started going to counseling at 14. And my counselor said to me, you need to write, like you need to, you need to journal. And I listened to her and I'm so glad that I did because that has just been like a lifelong practice. That's really like helped me, but I was exploring that in university and I was working almost full time, but not quite. And I was working in a real estate office. And oftentimes I was the only person in this office. There were only a few realtors that worked there. And I was working as an assistant and I would be there alone sometimes all day. And, you know, it's a, it's a dark morning and it's raining. It just rains so much where I'm from in Vancouver. And I was just feeling so low. And I just thought like, there's, there's just no way that I can fit myself into a nine to five Monday to Friday expectation and show up consistently every day to work. So that kind of became my motivation was how can I find success and be happy and create kind of a life of my own that works for me? I didn't realize, I guess, necessarily where I was going. I just knew that I I couldn't do the norm. So I was, I was getting creative and exploring other ways to kind of find something that worked for me. Yeah. I mean, like the system of work is, is a social construct in a lot of ways and it influences us to believe that we need to pursue a certain path or a certain approach that oftentimes puts us into boxes. So that's why work in my personal opinion feels so uncomfortable for a lot of people. And I always say like, I think it makes way more sense for us to do work that allows us to build the life that we love versus to focus on doing work that we love. So I I love what you said, because I think it would resonate with a lot of people and definitely resonated with me. So I'm curious, like, what about your feelings of being unhirable really pushed you into entrepreneurship? It's really the little things in your life that end up making you happy or unhappy. It's not really like the big picture title of being an entrepreneur or CEO. It's like, what time do you have to wake up? Can you talk about your personal life at work? How often do you have to sit at your desk? Do you have to work in the evenings? Do you have to work weekends? It's all these little like day-to-day minute details that I think ultimately stack up and are going to determine whether you're happy in your life or not. I knew that kind of having to show up at work, like at a job with people who don't really know me, don't really know my, my, my story and to put on a face, uh, to pretend. I knew that that would make me really unhappy. And I didn't know it at the time, but I think that's just my value of authenticity, which I hold so strongly today. 
I'm 34 and I've had to work at this a long time to figure out what my values are. But even looking back, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, you see your values in your emotional responses to things. And you may not even know them or be able to cognitively point them out, but you're living them already. And so entrepreneurship became, how can I work a sustainable amount of time in a sustainable way for me, in a flexible way that kind of allows me to have enough time to refuel my battery, eight hours a day, honestly, five days a week, it's a lot of time to spend at work. And I know that it's the norm and people are going to probably call me out for that because I'm an entrepreneur and I'm supposed to just hustle like, I don't know, 60 hours a week. Right. I've always been able to do a lot in a little amount of time, especially when that means that I get to like spend other time kind of, you know, refueling myself. So I guess To circle back to the question, it was really just like finding a more flexible and creative way to make a living without selling my soul. Yeah, I hear that. As someone that's been doing like HR for quite some time, I do think that the future of work is going to be more flexible and more focused on like consultants and freelancers and people that are really kind of like building and creating their own way of working. What's interesting about your story is that you didn't have like the typical starting point as most entrepreneurs. So I'd love for you to like to share a little bit about your starting point. Cause I think that that's a big differentiator for you as a, as an entrepreneur. I love that. Authenticity is a big one for me and freedom is another big one for me. I just, I think that like we have this life to live and we, we have to do it in a way that's true to who we are. And I'm not going to say we only have one life because who really knows? I don't really know, but I like to think that there's more. But I think in this lifetime, our biggest job and maybe our only job is to like really take care of ourselves and really give ourselves the best life that we possibly can. And if you're not being true to your values, you just can't do that. So I'm always a big proponent to that. You know, I do have a company now that does employ people and the standard working hours are nine to five, Monday to Friday or eight to three, or, you know, that's just kind of the standard. However, it's, if somebody doesn't want to work at my company and if they're not totally filled up and just loving being there, it's not the right fit. It's not a value alignment. You know, that's, that's like a key necessity because that's how I want people to show up. That's how I want to show up. And I really do think that is such a possibility for everyone. And you don't have to be an entrepreneur to to feel that way. You just have to love what you do. Um, And I've always believed that if you love what you do, the money will follow. I remember thinking this to myself when I was working at a restaurant called Milestones when I was 16, busing tables. And in my mind, I just thought like, I, I remember at the time I was thinking like makeup artistry. And that was something that I was really like interested in and I just thought like, okay, well, makeup artists don't make that much money, but if you really love something, you're going to be really good at it because you're going to spend more time doing it and therefore you'll become the best at it. And therefore you will be paid the money. So, and I look back at my 16 year old self and I'm like, damn, she had some, she had some wisdom. I still stay true to that. I took like a personality test once. It's like, it's like the top five personnel, the big five or something. And one of them is neuroticism. And I was like, top top for neuro- for neurotic, which essentially just means you have like more negative thoughts and feelings than most people. So that's something that I, I really had to work to get over. But both of my parents took an entrepreneurial journey. So my dad is, is still an entrepreneur. He's worked primarily in manufacturing and my mom was a model. She dropped out of high school when she was 16. She moved and lived all over Europe and lived in Asia and was modeling like until she was about into her late twenties and into her early thirties. So she took like a very unconventional route as well. And then she ran a business with my stepdad and she did the books and she was at home. And it was, I never ever saw parents getting up, putting on a suit, leaving the house at eight and coming home at six. Like that just wasn't the routine in my household. It was a bit more sporadic and unconventional and and less routine. So I think that definitely played a part. And then I, I honestly, I just jumped into 
what felt right at the time, which was going back to my early university days, I decided I wanted to be a realtor and I got my real estate license at 21. And I was just out there like working open houses for free on the weekends and picking up clients and learning how to prospect and cold calling and knocking on doors. And ultimately about two years in, I realized this is not for me. I hate sales. And I promised myself I would never make another cold call. And I left that industry and I started writing freelance and that became, you know, the blogger influencer thing. And then that became a marketing agency. And then eventually I got into product and I'm doing what I do now with Hoo-Ha. But when I look at it, you know, it feels very sporadic and all over the place. And I bounced around a lot, but there was always a, a through line of creativity. There was a through line of freedom and there was a through line of authenticity. And I had to kind of step off the path and veer off a few times to veer back on and realize, you know, what the path truly was for me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I think that going back to my question about the starting point is I feel like there's a lot of people that are having the same type of experience with their career where there's like this constant through line, but it's hard to know that that through line exists until you're further out, right? Like that's a matter of perspective. But what advice would you give to people that didn't necessarily have this like really stable starting point like you, but they have a dream that they want to pursue? Yeah, I I love that question. And I think it's really important because I know there's probably a lot of people out there like me looking for someone to look up to that they can see themselves in and that they can see their story in. And I know that when I was in my teens and I was like really ambitious and kind of knew that I wanted to do something big with my life and I was looking for someone to look up to that could model that for me, that I could see myself in. I really struggled because I just kept, I kept coming up against success stories where it was like Harvard level education. And I knew that that wasn't me. I mean, I was going to school at like a community college. I dropped out in my third year. It just wasn't my path. And so I felt very defeated and discouraged a lot of the time. And that's really why I like to share sort of like the humble beginnings and the real stuff, even though a lot of it is hard to share. I think it's important because I know now at 34, it took me a long time to understand this, but I know now that everybody has tragedy in their life. Like you don't have to scratch very far beneath the surface to find the tragedy in people's life. It's part of human nature. And we all have a different starting point and we all come from different backgrounds and different families. I come from a broken family. My, my parents divorced when I was really young and I had an emotionally abusive stepdad growing up. My sister developed a drug addiction when she was 16 and she was living on the streets and that just wreaked havoc on our family. And the stability in my home growing up was non-existent. I, I could never know and was a safe moment because at any point there could be just like a number of things happening and chaos. And so I really ended up living in like a, a very fight or flight state and my nervous system was really activated. And I think that a lot of people deal with this and don't even know it. And, you know, when you're young in your teens and in your twenties and into your thirties, maybe you can, you develop these coping mechanisms to get yourself through all of that. And then something happens in your life that is so beyond that you can no longer use those coping mechanisms. And that's when you really have to heal. And that's something that happened to me over the last couple of years. I realized that I had been using work and my dream of doing something big with my life and my ambition and desires as a form of a coping mechanism to deal with all the stuff that I hadn't dealt with. And then it was so funny the way it all kind of ended up happening because I remember there was this day that I, I pulled up Shopify sales. This was a few years ago. And it said the sales for the year, partway through the year, it was over a million dollars. And I remember taking a screenshot and sending, texting it to my mom. And she just responded. And she was like, what? Oh my God. Congrats, young lady. And I had like a mental breakdown. Like I was happy, but also growing up, 
what I told myself was, I want to have a million dollar company. That was what I, you know, like, I didn't know what that meant. But to me, a million dollars sounded like a lot. And it sounded like a good dream to have. So when I realized that I would hit that pinnacle, and that I still had all this stuff inside me that I hadn't dealt with, and I, I still had all this unhealed stuff, and that I wasn't this like, perfect version of myself that I thought I would be if I had a million dollar company. I am not kidding you. Like I just bawled for like hours. I just sat outside and I just had like a mental breakdown over it. And I think that's a part of success that people often don't talk about. Don't get me wrong. It's worth chasing and it's so wonderful, but it's only really worth it if you're also growing as a person alongside your financial growth or your notability as a person kind of in the spotlight, if you're not actually doing the work to be your best self on the inside, to heal some of the stuff that you've gone through, to really work through it, you're going to crash and burn. You are going to feel so, so hollow. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, It's so interesting. I think this is probably, in my personal opinion, one of the most like real shares we've had on the podcast so far. And I'm not saying this to discredit any other people that I've spoken to, but I just, I know that because I have a lot of friends that are entrepreneurs. I also have a lot of friends that are not entrepreneurs that work in nine to five careers, but they are like arguably the best in class at the top of their industry C-suite level. Uh, And I think honestly, in a lot of ways, navigating your way through a corporate ladder and becoming an executive at a, you know, multi-billion dollar company is a lot harder than becoming an entrepreneur because there's all sorts of bureaucratic shit that you have to, you have to move through. Um, But I will kind of share my own personal experience with this. In 2020, my life kind of like just shifted overnight where I shared a couple of Instagram posts and I attracted all these followers, which is incredible, that therefore then influenced massive growth in my business. I hired a bunch of people. uh, And then when I got through to this like next round of hiring and growth, my longtime partner who I was with for four years ghosted me. I was onboarding three people to join my team the Monday after the Saturday that he just left and disappeared into thin air. I have not spoken to him or talked to him since. We had a house together, everything. Very, very overwhelming. But I was like, okay, I can't take Monday off. I've got all these people showing up and I've just got to push. So I pushed and I pushed and I pushed. And then two and a half years later, things shifted within the business. We were really successful and I was like where I wanted to be in a lot of ways. But I had a couple of people that I hired around the time that he ghosted leave. And it was like, it wasn't this like point of success. It was actually like a a point of failure on my end as as a leader, having these people leave the business. But at the same time, I just like that breakup that I didn't address at that time because I put work first, I dealt with it then just out of nowhere. It just like, it just crept up to the surface and I couldn't, I had a breakdown, a full Thought throttle breakdown. I thought I was going to have to close down my business because I couldn't deal. And I know a lot of people that get to this point where they have these like milestones and sometimes they push through and they don't deal with their shit, but it, it comes to the surface eventually. Oh my God. Yeah. I have so much to say on that. It First off, there's always a tax to pay in life. And like, you just can't avoid feeling what you need to feel. At some point, it's going to get you. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you. That is like so shocking and so traumatizing and so hurtful. And I can't imagine the stuff that that individual hasn't dealt with in his life to make him do that. I can relate. A couple of years ago, I went through the process of ending an engagement. And I then like, I think it was a month later, I got accepted to go on Dragon's Den, which is like the Canadian version of Shark Tank. I was living in an Airbnb. I had no, like none of my worldly possessions. I left everything behind. All I had were were my clothes and a pillow. I was like, okay, like I'm going to do this. And I somehow did it. I, I don't know how I did it. It's like a survival and a coping mechanism. And, you know, you don't want to miss out on the beauty of your life when something terrible is happening. Like you do want to try your best to make the most of the situation. And so sometimes it's like, 
it's in our best interest to just hold off a little bit and process this a little bit later. But I think a lot of the time we forget to revisit what we need to revisit. We get busy and we get distracted and then we just leave it and then something terrible happens and then we have to deal with it. So I would say it's like always better to deal with things sooner if you can, but also don't miss out on an amazing opportunity because you're going through a breakup. Yes. It's like awful. And there's like, there's no worse feeling in the world. I don't think maybe, I mean, it's a, it's a form of grief, right? Like somebody doesn't have to physically die in order for you to grieve them and to grieve a relationship and to grieve a future that you thought you had and a love you thought you shared. It, it, in some ways it's harder. And I've had to go through that grief with my sister and her drug addiction so many times as a child, just like, why did she choose that? Like I miss my sister. I, I want my sister in my life going through that kind of grief. It's life is really messy. <laughs> I think that's just like the reality of it. And like, at some point, you know, we just have to, we have to deal with our stuff and realize like what the coping mechanisms are and, you know, put that aside. And I appreciate your vulnerability and everything you shared. We're talking a lot more than we ever had about like grief within the context of like our workplaces and then specifically like for individuals with their career. Like what advice do you have for folks that are navigating grief right now? First off, it's just, if there's anyone listening that's going through the process of grief, I just want to like hold space for that because it's in some ways, it's just like the most tender aspect of life. And there's a beauty in it. Actually, I found a really, really great therapist. <laughs> like I'm just so grateful for her because she had been through sort of the dark night of the soul herself. And I was going through my dark night of the soul. And if someone's listening to this and they're not familiar, please Google it. It's a worthwhile read and understanding of what that means because there's just like no, no better way to put it. And I remember listening to a podcast on grief and it, it talked about grief being this like activated feeling, like this activated sadness. Like it's not just sadness, it's activated. It is alive. You are searching, you are reaching, you are trying to find that comfort or that love that you lost. It's this like grasping. And my therapist gave me the courage to sit in my apartment that was not mine and to just feel whatever was coming up. And I... <laughs> really struggled with this. Like I am someone who fills her calendar. Like you would not believe, like it was so, so hard for me to not make plans in the evening after work. There was nothing more terrifying to me than going home to this apartment and sitting there alone and feeling what I needed to feel. And eventually I got to a place I was toying with it for a long time and struggling with this decision for a long time. Eventually I decided to accept help and I went on an SSRI and I, it took me about eight months of like regular anxiety and panic attacks to finally say to myself, okay, I'm going to accept help. And my only regret was not accepting that help earlier. Now I'm not prescribing that to everyone. And I don't agree with how the medical system just hands these things up like candy. It's not for everyone, but I think intuitively, like we know what we need. And sometimes going through grief and also needing to show up at work, you know, not wanting to let the rest of your life fall apart. Sometimes you need some tools. And when you can't get your mind because your nervous system is just so activated and you're, you know, having regular issues, sometimes you do need to accept help. One thing I wanted to mention too is that you'd mentioned the dark night of the soul. So, you know, for folks that may not necessarily be aware, it's used to describe a crisis of faith or a difficult, painful period in one's life. And oftentimes the symptoms of like a dark night of the soul could be like you lack energy and you also feel like really detached from your daily life. Uh, so when you're navigating a period of time, it, whether it may be like grief, depression, or a dark night of the soul, reconnecting with the parts of your life when you mentioned you don't want all the pillars to fall down, right? And like I I faced that. I was like, okay, my long-term person who I thought I was going to marry, who I have a house with, by the way, all my stuff is now gone. 
that pillar's down. The last thing I can do is let this pillar of work crumble. So I'm going to do every single thing I can to like keep myself up to a certain point. But the thing is, you're never really at your best when you have these things you're fighting behind closed doors. So how have you navigated the pressure of being an entrepreneur and having a team and building and scaling a business while navigating these very real experiences and like barriers in your life? It's not been easy. At every phase, I think it's changed a little bit. Again, like coping mechanisms are always, they're always alive in our lives and they just shift and hopefully become less damaging. And for me, uh, I think this is a healthy coping mechanism is I always ask myself, what's the worst case scenario? And that's always changing. In the beginning phases of dealing with the grief and, and showing up at work, I was really lucky and I'm really grateful to have had a team again that I could be transparent with. Like I went on this trip down to Portland with two of my team members at the time and we all cried together. Like we sat in the apartment that we rented and we cried together about different aspects of what we were going through in our personal lives. And had I not had that ability to be transparent and real with how I was feeling, I think I would have, I probably would have like, sold the company for peanuts and just like walked away. But having that emotional support, it allowed me to push through. I started creating safety in my life. I started paying myself a decent salary and I found some safety in like being like, okay, I have X amount of money in the bank. So if I can't do this anymore, if the company fails and there's another pillar gone in my life, at least I'll have, you know, a few months banked to like figure things out. And so that created a level of safety. And then, so you just kind of continue. I think that really helps with risk taking in entrepreneurship is, is finding ways to create safety for yourself so that you can answer that question to yourself. What happens if the worst case scenario shows up? I love that. And what advice do you have for folks that aren't entrepreneurs that want to find ways to create more safety for themselves where they may be maybe increasing their salary isn't something that they can readily do. Like what are some other things that you've done to cultivate that sense of safety? That's a good question because it's not always a, a decision that you can make for yourselves. But another way that I would suggest creating safety is creating options. Optionality creates safety because If one road doesn't work out, oh, look, there's four or five other roads. So for me, in my earlier career, I was building skill sets. So I was working on my writing, but I was also learning photography. And then I was also learning videography. And I was building these different skill sets so that I could say to myself, okay, if writing doesn't work out, I can do photography. And then I was learning how to, you know, make an apparel brand. And so I think working on skill sets and becoming proficient at other things that are maybe helpful in your current career path, but also provide an alternative path is not only going to create safety, but it's also going to create like abundance and options for you. If you just decide to pivot one day, because we all have the ability to do that and it's within our rights to, to change what we want to do. What I love about your story is that you, you, you've still kind of really pushed forward to create this amazing brand and now you have a team and you're making this huge impact through your products. Like how have your personal experiences influenced the type of company that you've gone on to build? It's such a beautiful question. And I agree. It's been such a nice conversation, really, truly authentic and all of the things that I really stand for. So thank you for creating that space. For me, it's like that self-awareness piece has just been so critical to be able to to catch myself. Self-awareness is everything, whether you're an entrepreneur or not. Like just knowing yourself is so, 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 so important. Something I've learned about myself is that I, I can be very easily influenced by the people in my life, especially the people I love and trust. So as I've gotten older, I've realized that I need to keep my circle really, really small like really just my best friend in the world and like my mom and my middle sister. These are the people that influence me. And I don't need to speak to a professional business mentor to be able to be the best version of myself and my company and to be able to do that. I just need to have the best people in my inner circle who love me and want the most for me and who are true to be able to 
maintain a positive mindset and stay on the right track myself and be in alignment with my goals. And then everything else is easier. Sometimes I think we overcomplicate it and we're like, oh, I need to have this like really successful business mentor and I need to like be involved in all these things. And I'm not going to say that there's not value to that because of course, the more you expose yourself to success and these ideas and things, it's like, it's great, but you can also do that through podcasts. You can also do that through books. And like, we just have to be really protective of ourselves and mindful of that in order to ensure that we're creating positivity in the world with whatever we're putting out there. And what I love about what you shared is the emphasis on kind of keeping your circle small. I think that we're in this age where radical candor, radical transparency, radical authenticity has been such a, you know, a popular movement. But uh, one thing that I personally believe in is that not everyone is entitled to our authenticity. Not everyone is ready for our authenticity and not everyone's deserving of our full vulnerability. Yet chief people officers t- saying to everyone, hey, bring your authentic self to work. We know that it's not totally safe for everyone to show up authentically. So I, I like that you, you know, talked about th- these moments where you're able to have a lot of vulnerability amongst you and your team members, which I think is amazing. Um, but oftentimes that needs to be earned uh, in order to feel safe to do that. And I do think that we need to practice perhaps like having these smaller circles because I think that sometimes people will go to the wrong folks uh, to share and to find that safe space. And then oftentimes exasperates an already really terrible situation perhaps. And I know because this really resonated with me is you have all this influence, like outside influence that's pushing you in certain directions that you know aren't good for you. I knew when I left one company, I was working at a tech company and I just come off of a workplace assault and went into another tech company. I knew the vibes were weird. I knew I was not going to have a good experience, but I was like, I got to make money and pay my bills and I got to make this work. When really ultimately I could have just perhaps gone home and really shared with my fa- family and parents like, hey, this is where I'm at. I'm going to need a little bit of support for the next couple of months so I don't rush into this exact same scenario. And ultimately, I intuitively knew it wasn't the right decision. I went and worked there anyway, and I didn't listen to myself. And as a result, I found myself kind of deeper into this like situation. But I think that there's always this like other influences that are like, oh, this is such a great company or like the salary is amazing or you're going to be able to work with this person, this leader, this is going to be so good for your career. But you, not even sometimes intuitively, you just know because you have all the information that you need to work with because you are most aware of like the situations you've been through, the experiences that you've had. You're the one who went to the job interview. You're the one who had the conversations with the hiring managers. No one else did. So you're oftentimes working with the most information, but you allow people that have like 10% of what you know that will influence you in a direction, (laughs) down a path that's not for you. So I totally agree with that. I am so for intuitive decision-making and I just want to caveat that like, I want people to be really careful about this though, because when you have trauma that you haven't dealt with, it can feel like your intuition, but it's not, it's your trauma. And it's, it's actually really hard to differentiate between, is this my nervous system reacting to something I'm afraid of? Or is this my intuition guiding me lovingly in a direction that's better for me? How do you know? It's so hard, but I've learned some, I've learned some things. First off, dealing with the trauma and, and, and dealing with the healing that you need to do will help you. And then using intuition for small, almost meaningless decisions that can't harm you. So I think sometimes we, we want to rely on our intuition with like the biggest life decisions. And that's a lot of pressure for your, your, your little voice that maybe needs some strengthening. The other thing, and I think truly using that with like the trivial things can help you hone that ability. And then you can start practicing with bigger decisions. And I do this now in my company where I'm like, I mean, as a startup, there's just no time. There's never enough time in a day. And you can't, I literally can't spend sometimes more than five minutes to make a decision that you have to make so many decisions in a day. And so I've started using this more with like some of the more trivial decisions in the business. Is this a go or no go? And oftentimes I'll just say to my team, it's a no go. We're not going to spend our time on this. This is a distraction. And that's an intuitive gut check. Something that I, I will just say that I have learned is intuition doesn't sound mean. It doesn't sound scary. And it doesn't sound threatening. 
it sounds gentle. It sounds loving and it sounds kind of quiet, but it's like a whisper, but it's like very present. If it feels scary and like aggressive, it's probably more likely your trauma or criticisms in your head or criticisms from other people. I love that. Okay. So I think that that might be a perfect place for us to wrap up this conversation. I feel like you and I could talk for hours and hours and hours. I think before we wrap up, I wanted to see if you have any advice that you'd like to leave our listeners with. Yeah. I think there's something that I'll leave, which is something that I'm leaning on right now that's providing me comfort. And it's actually a line from a movie called life itself. Essentially, you know, life is going to hurt you. It's going to bring you to your knees. It's going to bring you so much further down than you ever thought you could go, which is that grief we speak of. And that if you just keep going, and if you just take like one more step and you just move forward, there's always love waiting for you you'll always find love again. And I'm in a place in my life now where I've found love again. And it's something that I truly didn't think I would ever have again. I thought my life was over. So whether it has to do with love or family or career, you know, whatever's going on in the listeners lives right now, there will be love again. There will be positivity again. That is a for sure thing. And I promise, I promise it. It's 100%. So just keep going. I'm so glad that you found love again and you found your way there. And I'm really happy that you took the time to share so much about who you are and yourself today. I've been blown away too. You're amazing. And this was such a wonderful conversation. So thank you for creating the space and, and uh, yeah, just being so easy to talk to. It's really, really nice. Thank you. So for folks that uh, still want to follow along on your journey and want to learn more about you and your business, where can they find you? They can find Hua on Instagram or W-E-A-R-H-U-H-A. Um, they can find me on Instagram, Alexa Suter, S-U-T-E-R. Um, and they can check out our website if they're interested to learn more about what we do. It's H-U-H-A.com. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> And that's a wrap on my conversation with Alexa. I hope Alexa's vulnerability shed some light on the power of resilience and the journey of finding positivity again after hardship. I know it did for me. I'd love to know what you thought of our conversation. So send us a DM on Instagram at Girlboss Radio and give us a follow for even more podcast content. Tune in next week for another episode with a very special guest. And until then, don't forget to leave us a comment and rate it five stars. As always, this podcast is produced by Victoria Christie and Camilla Nizio and edited by Diego Domine. Until next time, keep blooming. Thank you.